Look, good afternoon, all of you who are, who have just um, logged on. Um, I'm David from um, D2 Solutions. Just making a mention here that we're just giving people a few minutes. So if you just give us another minute or two of grace to, for people to join and then we'll get started. And with that, we've hit 12.03, so as long as you can all hear me OK, at least the presenters can have a thumbs up if you can see me and hear me. Great, thanks. Look, good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to Education Reimagined. But before we start, just a few notes to everyone. Firstly, besides the presenters, you're all on mute. So if you have questions, I'm encouraging you all to post them, and you can do this throughout the session in the chat area. That's usually to the right of your screen. We have some time set aside at the end to look at some of these, so please do post them. Now, some of your questions may be answered during the session, so it's not uncommon for there to be very few questions, sometimes none at all. So don't stress about that. If you run out of time and can't get to them all, we will respond to them after the event and circulate afterwards. OK, so get started. I'm David Grayson from D2 and Associates. We're a consulting and advisory organisation with an absolute passion for education. And we're based out of, well, it, that doesn't really matter anymore, does it? And that's part of what today is about. But enough about me. So let's get into it, education reimagined. In thinking about today's session, it occurred to me that every single person in this session, and I mean every single person, has one thing in common. And that one thing that's in common has personal relevance to the topic today. And that is, we've all been in a classroom. And that classroom, look, it may have been a traditional one. It may have had a teacher at the front and students at desks taking notes, or sometimes not. And you may have grown up in Kunnamulla or Charleville. Yes, I'm from Queensland. And, and you did your learning over the school of the air. But the point is this, we've all sat listening to a teacher of some sort and at some point have the shared experience of, excuse me, I, I, I've got a question. And from the most shy person to the loudest, we've all reached out for a way to put our hands up, you know, to be heard, to gain a better understanding and at a deeper level to connect. So the question is, how do we provide an environment for students in which every question is acknowledged, that's, that's answered, in which every interaction provides some feedback. So how can students be made to feel as though they are heard amongst an absolute sea of students? How do we do that? In fact, can we do that? Look, and from an alternative perspective, how can you as educators, how can you hope to respond to every student's questions? How is that possible in today's world where students may have questions at all hours, you know, hundreds of them, and they want a response and, and they want it yesterday. So this requirement to connect, to be heard, to feel as though you're not just a number, it must be an almost impossible task to accommodate this as an educator. It must be overwhelming. So this experience is common to everybody, but why is this so important today? And where does education reimagine fit into this? Now there's no point in attempting to give everybody a history lesson of how the past 12 months has affected the way in which we communicate in all spheres of life. Why we're here is to explore the future, to examine what's possible, what's probably not, things that perhaps may help guide our decision making, things with amazing terms like AI, which is artificial intelligence, or ML, which is machine learning, you know, data analytics and bots, smallish things that actually can have a significant impact on the student learning experience. All right, so here's a thought. What if it were possible to answer those hundreds of common questions that impact the daily life of every lecturer, every tutor, now, is there a world in which majority of easily answered questions could be seemingly, you know, magically answered, leaving the educators to focus on higher value activities such as, well, you know, teaching or researching or developing new content? And with all of this technology, are there opportunities or ways we could use this enormous amount of data we keep hearing about? You may have heard of data lakes or more accurately data swamps for most of them. Can we use those to provide insights into the experience of the students and the educators, things like student engagement, even the success or otherwise 
of your course materials and content. Uh, Christine, can we have the next slide, please? Ah, thank you. So today we will be joined by three industry experts to help answer some of these questions. Firstly, by Thomas King from Microsoft. So Thomas will be giving us an overview of where technology is heading in the future, and more specifically, the technology platforms that are the foundations, the types of initiatives we'll be hearing about today. We'll then hear from Roy Pigeon, who's the Deputy Vice, uh, well, Deputy VP of the Digital Services from CQU at Central Queensland University. Roy will speak to the CQU experience of enabling new ways to educate and to collaborate, new ways in which education has been reimagined. And then lastly, we will hear from Suleb Jain from Antari Solutions, who will provide an overview of the platform from which these reimagined initiatives are born. And with that, I'd like to introduce Thomas. And next slide, please, Christine. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Thomas King here. So uh, yeah, today I'm going to cover um, education reimagined and talk to you a little bit about um, what we're seeing uh, and how um, we're helping uh, universities and educational institutions uh, improve the student experience and um, improve teaching and learning in the crazy world we live in these days. Uh, so next slide, please. So Microsoft's mission, it's, I think it's important to highlight um, our mission is to empower every organisation and every person on the planet to achieve more. Uh, it is not so different um, to many of the aspirations of the universities, um, particularly in Australia around um, knowledge creation, knowledge dissemination, um, community engagement. Um, we're absolutely here to help every person, every organisation to achieve more. So next slide, please. So the world has changed and um, I've obviously got a hashtag global pandemic. Um, everyone's aware of it. Everyone has a different lived experience uh, from the pandemic since January last year. And, and really it's provided a huge amount of challenges, but it's also provided opportunities. Um, for experiences um, using digital technology. Um, it's become something that's been an imperative for many. Uh, the conduct of teaching and learning in a purely online mode. Obviously, we're lucky enough in Australia that we've been able to transition back into the classroom, back onto campus, but much of that interaction is still hybrid. And although a lot of people um, are worried about what we're going to do in hybrid. I think it is um, far worse overseas. So we're probably six months ahead of many countries in terms of our return to campus and what the new normal looks like. And so we'll explore that uh, a little bit uh, during this uh, session today. So next slide, please. So the challenges and most people on the on this uh, call will be very familiar with these challenges. Um, huge funding challenges. Um, challenges around the core business model. We've had challenges in terms of government policy and accountability. And um, in Australia, you know, that's meant different fee structures for different courses and programs this year. Um, it's meant potential new legislation about deeming universities critical, critical infrastructure. We've had the countering foreign interference legislation. Um, we've had the role of universities and the role um, the sector can play helping people change uh, and be job ready for a change of employment, for example. Um, we've had um, unbundling of education accelerate um, during the pandemic, and we've obviously had anytime, anywhere, and remote slash hybrid everything. Uh, and we've also seen a huge challenge uh, since the pandemic around cybersecurity and physical safety, where every other day or every other week, um, an institution um, has had a data breach or has had a major cybersecurity incident. It is really um, challenging times. So I think those challenges are fairly similar for most institutions. Some would be way differently than there might be some others. And really, does this list represent your institution's challenges? There's, there's probably others out there, um, but we're certainly not short of challenges. Uh, so next slide, please. So what that meant is um, transformation. How, how do people respond, um, recover and reimagine higher education and how are they going to ensure that they can meet their strategic objectives 
of their institution. And we've really only start to see, we're only at the start of that transformation in higher education. And the pandemic has meant, well, it's really not a choice to transform anymore. It's generally seen as an imperative. So how is your institution thinking about the staff experience? Um, academics are hugely overloaded and did Herculean work to actually get classes running as best they could last year. So how do we actually acknowledge that and potentially give them time back? And if we want to improve the student experience and you know everyone who doesn't want to improve the student experience, but if we want to provide them a seamless integrated student experience that that spans across the physical and digital campus and make it unique and authentic. One of the best ways we can do that is focus on the staff experience and the experience your faculty has and how you're going to make life easy for them. How are you going to give them time back? Because they're going to pay that back in spades. One, they'll be eternally grateful and probably pleasantly surprised, but two, they'll give that time back to their students. They'll spend that time with their students. They'll spend that time conducting research. They'll spend that time generating new knowledge. Um, it will create a virtuous circle. How is your institution thinking about hybrid teaching and learning? Whether you preference on campus, whether you uh, uh, somewhere in the middle around uh, having some sort of blended strategy or whether you um, are more purely online, what is hybrid learning going to mean for you? And how is your institution thinking about accessibility, diversity and inclusiveness? And that's one of the really great things we've seen. Um, the digital has been able to really reduce that inequity in a lot of areas, but maybe it's exacerbated it in others. So how is your institution thinking about that and how are you going to improve that area? Next slide, please. So let's look for a cue to the future about how the other sectors are transforming. And I've got here today just a, just a banking example. Five years ago, your relationship and your interaction with your bank was one of two things. Essentially, it was a relationship with a branch and some people in a branch that you knew or with a contact center. Fast forward to today, and next slide, please. And really your relationship and your interaction with the bank, it's primarily a digital experience run through an app. And if you see, for example, um, Shane Elliott, who's the CEO of ANZ Bank, you see where he spends his time, you see what he talks about, you see what he posts on LinkedIn, for example, it's all around the digital experience the, that their app provides um, because it's so important to customer experience. So important that those interactions um, that, that people um, have with the bank day in, day out work, are seamless and are um, easy to use, easy to understand. They have a good experience. Not saying that the investments we've made in campuses are defunct, not at all. Even if you preference strongly a face-to-face -face experience, the enhancement that a positive and seamless and personalized digital experience can provide will really make a difference. Uh, and conversely, if it's a really poor digital experience, can detract from the billions of dollars you may have invested in your campus. So let's let's keep moving. Thank you. So when we talk about this transformation, whether you come at it from a culture first, a people first, or a digital first kind of approach, you need to consider all of these aspects, the change management, the people impacts, the things you're going to do differently in terms of how you operate and the digital components. You have to consider all of this. And if you don't, you know, you're at risk of um, not successfully transforming. So that's that's the point I want to get across there because so many of you out there are in the midst of this transformation. You know, please make sure that you do consider all of these components. They're generally not digital projects or people projects or culture projects. They're just business improvement projects. Um, next slide, please. So when we think about redesigning the student experience, students expect universities to engage with them in the way that consumer brands do for most things. You know, they are very long term, you know, three or four year relationships in the main. And our students have an expectation for personalized, memorable experiences that are connected and joined up and are authentic and distinctive to um, that reflect your institution's values. That's really what they're looking for. And again, it's underpinned by fantastic digital experience that is connected, that has 
uh, a really good understanding of the data that needs to be collected, how that data can be used together to turn it into information and then that information into insights about how these services are being received. For example, what's the on-campus experience? How many students are going to different touch points on campus? Student services, the library, IT, how are they seeking help? How is that help received? Um, how instead of a student satisfaction survey at the end of each course, can you get student feedback on an ongoing iterative basis so you can incrementally improve those services and improve that experience? So all things to think about about redesigning the student experience and and Roy um, will go through a bit more CQU's journey about that, which I think is a, is a fantastic journey. So please, next slide. So when we get back to hybrid learning, I think it's really important to distinguish last year, which was remote learning and a temporary necessity. Uh, and we're lucky to say it's last year because many countries um, are either gone back fully into remote learning or they've gone in and out of it. Um, hybrid learning is a flexible learning experience that's built on thoughtfully planned infrastructure. It, you know, it's actually planned, it's actually scalable, it actually empowers students to succeed, and it enables education to continue regardless of what's going on. It's conducive to active engagement. It can be asynchronous and synchronous. It can be multimodal, it can be interactive, and it can accommodate all the students, whether they're offshore in China, trying to participate, and they're nervous about the sort of experience they had because they really wanted to land on shore, whether they're on campus or whether they're from home because they might have a cold and you don't want a student coming on campus with a cold. So next slide, please. So at Microsoft, we have a, a framework to have some of these conversations that are specific to higher education, whether it's teaching and learning, student success, academic research, or creating a secure and connected campus. And there's a link there um, and a URL that you can go and find out more information. So I just wanna make sure you're aware of that and the resources around that that we have to help you um, with that transformation. So next slide, please. We also have platforms for transformation and we're going to focus on obviously teams and some of the innovation happening around teams, but those other platforms are, are critical. Uh, Microsoft 365, Power Platform, Dynamics, Azure. I think Teams um, has an amazing amount of development happening. You know, there's over 145 million monthly users on Teams now and just in education in Australia, there's over 1.5 million students and staff who use Teams every month. And I think that's that's amazing and that's obviously growing and they're using it as where they're learning, they're using it for where they're teaching and they're using it for how they're working and studying and connecting. Next slide, please. So today, um, you know, uh, we'll be talking more about some of these. Uh, if you look on the engaged students line up to redefinition, you know, there's things we're going to talk about nudging behavior, personalized experiences, personal assistance, um, bots. AI, machine learning. Um, so all of these things, obviously, we've got capabilities to help with. And we certainly uh, encourage you all to use this um, slide and this transformation just when you're considering things about uh, creating a personalized student experience, developing and supporting lifelong learning, improving employee impact and employee experience, and creating that student affinity with the university. They're all ways which you can use our platforms um, to provide those capabilities in a way that's distinctive and authentic for your own institution. So um, happy to take any questions. I think we're taking questions at the end. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to hand over um, to Roy, I think is next to talk to you more about the CQU um, transformation program, which is very exciting. Roy, uh, 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 you may be on mute. Thank you. Much better. Excellent. Well, look, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, uh, today I'm joining you uh, from Rockhampton, uh, which is Durumbal country. Um, and so before we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands here that we work and, play and learn on and pay respects to the First Nations people and their elders past, present and future. Um, 
Next slide, please. Uh, so a bit about Seeker University uh, before we get too further underway, because of course it's the lens that I, um, I'm naturally looking at uh, the, the world in at the moment. Um, Seeker University here, this, this heat map actually, uh, shows just how wide Seeker University's um, students are in terms of this, this spread right across Australia. In fact, I could have shown you a heat map of the whole world and you'll see um, our online students participating from, from right around the world. Um, you also see in these statistics that about half of our students just study online with us or in some sort of mixed online mode. And the reality is that many of our face-to-face -face students really only come for uh, a lot of the richer moments that they really need to, and they heavily rely on online-based digital education, if you like. The university in this last year, we would normally be about 35,000 students. We currently aren't quite that big, and that's because uh, we have had a big, pretty big impact from international um, student and borders closing. Uh, a problem that many universities have had and, and have had to adjust to. And we've done that adjustment um, as difficult as that has been. So a quick note about, you know, given that profile and the fact that we have actually 26 locations spread across the universe, uh, across Australia to support the face-to-face -face needs of, univers of, of university students. Um, you might imagine that we're probably in a pretty good position to be able to weather the COVID work from home uh, shift that we all had to quickly make last year. Um, and we did go pretty well, you know, as everyone went, went home. Um, but like everyone, we learned a lot from that, that experience. And I think it really served to underscore why investing in digital is just so important. Next slide, please. So what does digital transformation look like at CQU? Well, uh, as we've heard, there are numerous innovation opportunities emerging in this dynamic environment. As technologies mature and the education market moves from what many call a higher ed golden age of demand coming to universities, it's a much more tumultuous political and international environment. Tom's has outlined that really well. In, at the end of 2019, um, we launched this program, recognising that investment in technologies was going to be important for the ongoing operations. Our Vice-Chancellor championed a broad program underpinned by digital transformation. We called it CQU Renew. At a high level, this is what CQU University's digital transformation is embedded inside. Um, there are three pillars here. The curriculum structure and delivery is less about technology, but it's very much underpinned by it. And it's about working on our products. The digital technology and online experience is the stream that I've um, been championing and leading. And uh, then the third one is around personalising the student engagement, support and services. And we give them our own project names as you do. Uh, but this is the first time that we at the university have pushed on all three areas in a unified fashion at CQ University. We've always been working on these things. Digital transformation we know is hard work, particularly when it's across the whole entire organisation. So one of the keys to success for us is anchoring it with a strong strategy and strong sponsorship from the executive management team. CQU's done that for this program. It was agreed to by all the key senior stakeholders from, and the provost, in fact, it was given the carriage to run the whole program, uh, backed by the executive. And of course, the vice chancellor provided the vision for the program and is a strong advocate, which really helps with getting buy-in across the university, as you might imagine. Next slide, please. So one of the key things of this strategy of CQU Renew, and the goal was, I quote, to, extend, 
to enhance and expand and improve our entire student experience. The role of the digi our digital transformation program underneath that is therefore ruthlessly about improving student experience. Students expect an experience when they come to university. They don't just want knowledge and pieces of paper to say they've finished a university degree, even if they are, have chosen to study online. They expect and demand a learning experience that's positive, engaging, seamless and personalised. Displayed on this slide is a representation of the student life cycle uh, and how we divided the phases of that life cycle up. It's been really useful for us as we work through our program. Because many of our projects within this TQ focus on different experiences uh, within these phases. Uh, the individual projects that contribute all are about improving the experience of student and it helps us to really focus on how we can provide and add value. The middle block there is where we started first. So personalising the student experience phase. Yes, that phase included building uh, a mobile app, if you like, really focusing on a personalised app, not a broad student portal. But in that phase, you have to look at all those other great things that Thomas outlined, um, really important, and, and continue to build on it. To ensure we innovate in this program, not just improve on some of the existing solutions we had in place, we've utilised human-centred design as one of our core principles in this approach. Next slide, please. So I put it to you that, you know, when we're focusing on the learning and teaching part of this overall experience, it's worth thinking about what we've learned so far in this really interesting times. And I think one of them is that online is not the only way forward. A blended approach can support students according to the mode of study they choose or need to undertake. And some subjects and skills still benefit clearly from face-to-face -face delivery. We can use technology to enhance that face-to-face -face delivery for sure, but blended is part of it. You can see from this slide, the LMS is a cornerstone to delivery across all modes. For CQU, it served us well. We've invested in automation and the design experience of the LMS. It provides educators a reliable platform for content and assessment. Uh, and they really need reliability in, this, in these times. But collaboration tools have really come to the forefront across our whole work and socially connected lives. Students are expecting these tools in their learning journey. And the new social collaboration, collaborative tools do it really well. So they need to be part of the story. But the physical also has to be as well. Classrooms at CQU have long been video enabled. We needed that to support that footprint. But they also need to involve with that increased demand and focus on collaboration. The trick is to design all these platforms to work together in a seamless way that supports the student experience based on how they're participating. Next slide, please. Thanks. So one of the key technologies we introduced is Microsoft Teams as a learning and teaching collaborative platform. We've integrated it seamlessly into the LMS and also our academic information management system for the automation. The integration for us at this stage means that our lecturers opt in to Microsoft Teams at the start of term for the unit by just ticking a checkbox. This automatically creates a team for them and adds the enrolled students into that team in a standard format with channels that integrate with information from our LMS. You're looking here at um, 
our, one of our Moodle subjects embedded inside Microsoft Teams. But it works vice versa. On our units page inside our MIMS, they also contain units, uh, sorry, links uh, to the unit in Microsoft Teams. So the students can seamlessly operate between the two platforms, whichever way they want to come into it. And the point of this is they don't have to hunt around and find their team or unit from either platform. Getting to this stage, we use pilots to test and improve the solution before offering it as an opt-in service for all higher ed units. And in a short time, it's really become integral and a useful platform for supporting learning and teaching. Next slide, please. Well, um, so to prove the success in less than a year since we put Microsoft Teams into production, over 41% of our lecturers at CQ University are now actively using Microsoft Teams as part of their learning and teaching delivery in this current term, term one, our biggest term, of course. That is a massive percentage for a platform that is voluntary. We've never seen an uptake like this before at CQ University, something that's, that's optional. Not only are many of our staff and students loving it, as you can see from these bits of feedback that are on the slide, um, but we believe our students are now developing a competitive edge over our other graduates. Um, they're providing them with realistic experience of virtual teamwork and online collaboration, which is, of course is so commonplace in many organisations, including our own in terms of our own business operations. Teams has allowed our educators to structure their education to delivery, creating specific channels focused on weekly topics, a seamless, seamless single space for collaboration, conversation and fresh content if that's what they need to do. Thanks, next slide. So, how do we take this to the next level? Getting that buy-in with the collaborative platform is the first step, uh, but it is an incredibly powerful platform. Um, we're now trying to start taking advantage of the artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities that you can uh, you have with Microsoft Teams, introducing concepts like bots into uh, that teaching experience. Now. I just want to tell you about an example of something I heard recently. Um, one, it was actually now um, one of our law subjects. A student was really nervous about an upcoming assignment. She posted close to midnight into one of the team channels um, that she was really nervous about the upcoming assignment, the different format of the, of the approach that the assignment was talking about uh, and expressed her concern. We've all been there. She was wondering if it was going to be covered off in the next tube. Um, so anxious student, classic stuff. Nine o'clock the next morning, the lecturer logged in to Microsoft Teams and responded in a supportive, collaborative way as you'd expect they would in that Teams channel. Now, that's a really timely response and so much better than what would have happened before, which would have been through an email um, chase. It could have happened a week, over a week, given some of our inboxes. The great thing about it was that all the other students in that channel saw that interaction with plenty, many of them would have had that same question. So she reached out to all of them in one go. But let's think about this. That's a great interaction, but how can we take it to another level? What if through a bot, we were able to incite some proactive communication with that student when they were having that moment of panic at midnight. Um, through bots and through the data that you get through the sentiment um, and intent of students using these platforms, you can start to develop solutions that address that. We're seeing really interesting data about sentiment and um, engagement uh, of students that we've never seen before. This is really starting to talk about engagement with students. More engagement with students we know helps the learning experience. 
and we expect that this will help with retention as well as quality of outcome. And we all know that retention is a really hard thing to work on in, in, in our institutions. If you even just nudging the bar by one or two points, it has a huge impact on our universities. And both universities from a bottom line, but also governments are focused on improving retention and um, success of students. We are investing in um, Alex, which is a bot that Antares have been working on with us and, and others. It's designed to work in this sort of space. Right now, we're looking to make it more visible in our channels, almost like having another participant in that unit. We're on the cusp of activating these bots to help support and engage our students like we've never had really before. Next slide. So CQU success in our digital transformation projects uh, comes down to good change management. There are great change management programs out there if you're on this pathway, you've probably already grabbed one and using it. And it's not, so this is new to you. I'll put a bit of colour on some of the key things that I think we work for us. In this context, first the design was really important. Architecting this, using human-centred design, but also focusing on the experience of staff and students, making it easy for them, but also data-driven was really important. Secondly, we use an agile approach. This helps us deliver stuff quickly, but also get feedback and improve and refine the product. And that's where we really used our pilots, getting those, those keen people to give us feedback, really great feedback early on. But once a change is delivered and started, you need to keep improving it. Broader, broader um, user base means you need to find other things that you've got to improve uh, to make it work for everyone. And finally, you need to celebrate the successes. We have monthly showcases uh, where we encourage our um, digital products to be showcased by uh, our academic and educating leaders. And they advocate how the benefits have worked for them. And sometimes they'll tell you the what's as well, uh, which is fantastic because it's even more feedback and how we weave it in. So that authentic sharing all helps to build that momentum. Uh, and another key is where we can uh, really encourage the opt-in approach so that we're not telling we're helping. Next slide, please. So uh, in summary, before I pass on to uh, Sulab, who's going to talk a bit more about the technology side of the opportunities here. I just want to reiterate that look, change is really possible, but of course it is hard work. If you have this vision and strategy and you have the support and drive from your executive in strategy and voice, then it makes it a lot easier. Education can be reimagined in many ways and embarking on digital transformation across one area or multiple can set you on a path for improving the student experience. So thank you, and um, I'll pass back to you, David. Thanks very much, Roy, that, that was terrific. Um, now, look, I'm just gonna hand over to Sulab, and Sulab's going to explain really the why and, and the how behind the development of the platform that supports these new learning capabilities. And can I, there's just one other thing I'd like to emphasize, and that is, just keep in mind Roy's point there, which which really struck me, and that was about the agility in the approach by having pilots. You know, the, the ability to fail fast, come back and have multiple iterations, as opposed to that, the projects we'd have 10, 15 years ago, which were all or nothing. So Sulab is going to take us through the why and the how. So over to you, Sulab. Thank you, David, and thank you for the uh, amazing presentations, um, Roy and Thomas. I actually learned a lot from that, even even though I work uh, very closely with with, uh, with each of you. Uh, hi, everyone. A uh, pleasure to meet you all. Uh, my name is Philip Jain, and I'm the education industry lead for Antares. 
Uh, building off the, the presentations from Roy and Thomas, uh, I, I wanted to give you a, a quick overview of Alex or the Adaptive Learning Experience Platform um, that we're implementing for a, a number of universities um, around the world. Our purpose is to help students reach their full potential. And, and that is really central to what we do on Alex on a day-to-day -day basis and how we go about research and development to advance uh, and evolve the platform for our, for our customers. And like Thomas said, one of the ways we improve student experience is by actually making the staff experience better and in saving them time so they have more time to spend with students. So they have more time in delivering personalized education to the students based on their own strengths um, and weaknesses. But more about this is later. Put simply, Alex is a data-driven AI-based platform that builds learning communities with students and academics and provides a personalized learning experience for students. Alex helps improve student and faculty experience and their perception of the institution. We often find that students and academics that use this technology are more likely to recommend the institution they're studying with uh, with their known ones. Alex also improves overall student engagement uh, by building social connections and learning communities and in turn improving their likelihood to complete their course. And lastly, institutions using Alex are seen as more innovative in the industry and drive more interest from students and faculty who are looking for a place to study or teach. So the Alex platform comprises of three main components. It has a digital learning assistant called QBot that builds an open and inclusive learning community that promotes questions and knowledge sharing among students and teachers. QBot is built into every single team in Microsoft Teams and uses AI to answer previously asked questions. It learns from every question and answer and gets smarter and smarter over time. The analytics engine provides deep insights into patterns and trends and provides information on how students are engaging with the content. It identifies which students are engaged, not engaged, and therefore may require attention. The analytics is built on research on how social communities effectively work. For example, we know that students with high network tend to perform better than others. Students tend to group together with other students that tend to score similarly. And teachers tend to spend more time with students that are high performers and so on. And recent capability added through our partner Analyticus, uh, a partner of ours in, in US, we can now look into student submissions or pieces of content that students have written, supplement that information we have about them in, in the learning management system and other student information systems, and we can draw a portrait of the student's characteristics based on 16 powerful building blocks that are categorized in four categories that look at students' self-management and planning skills, the social and teamwork skills, emotional indicators such as anxiety, depression, resilience, self-esteem, and their sense of achievements, their learning styles and learning difficulties. That information allows QBot to nudge students with the right information at the right time, like Ro alluded to before. And lastly, our provisioning engine makes it all happen. Uh, it integrates with your learning management system and other student information systems to draw the information it needs. It sets up the classes in teams based on how academics have set up their courses in the LMS, providing a zero touch experience for academics. And whilst at the same time, setting up teams as a platform for all communication and collaboration needs to enhance the overall student experience, ultimately to form effective learning communities. So the Alex platform is built to cater to the needs of students, teachers, and the institution. For students, it builds and social uh, builds a social and inclusive learning community with fellow students and academics, like I've said a few times. It promotes greater student-to-student -student interactions, helps students with remote learning and asking questions after the class, and promotes active and self-directed learning among students. The questions and answers created are per topic, 
but they're also authentic as they're self curated by the students and teachers themselves, as opposed to from a textbook. And the students start to value the means to asking a question, knowing that their question will probably lead to a discussion, collaboration and, and an answer. And lastly, it allows the student to gain recognition, opportunity and engagement as part of a community, which makes a huge difference to the student engagement. Alex allows teachers to address new areas of inquiries, confident that the routine questions are going to be answered and therefore allows teachers more time to engage with students. The detailed analytics helps teachers understand what questions students are asking, what topics have most questions, what student networks are forming, where are the centers of influence, and provides detailed information on students' personality, their preferred learning styles, so they can personalize the delivery of material for each student. And for the institution, it drives better educational outcomes by providing greater value from existing investments in technology through integration and automation with existing systems. It allows the institution to advance to adapted learning experience with digital delivery mapped to existing LMS and scale the system as required without additional capital expenditure. And lastly, it allows the institution to create a compelling point of difference in the quality of experience for both students as well as the academics. So how do we implement Alex? Firstly, Alex is a SaaS based platform, which means it exists in the cloud. And if you read the tagline, it takes more than good software to drive success. You can see that there is a far broader set of competencies and support that exists beyond mere consumption of the Alex platform. We typically start with an assessment and benchmarking exercise to determine the current state of both existing systems and the user maturity. We then offer pilot programs to Roy's point before, where we introduce Alex to the institution via select pilot group across a six month period, during which we provide adoption and technical service assistance and throughout. Once the gender learnings, experiences and, and specific changes have been made and successfully applied, that's when the platform is ready for broader implementation across additional courses, lecturers, students, etc. Uh, and the platform is ready to, to be consumed organization wide. So that's it basically. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, my email is here. If you want to reach out to me with any questions you have, please feel free to do so. If you'd like to see some of the work we've been doing using this platform, there is also a video available on the link provided here and we'll share that in the chat as well. If you're, in the, if you're interested in the platform, I recommend um, having a conversation with me, organizing a demo of the platform with your academics to gather broad interest. Uh, and if that is of interest to the academics, we can then discuss what the pilot program might look like for you. Beyond the, beyond the Alex platform, we do also do a lot of work in the education sector as trusted advisors on Office 365 and, and, and Azure, ranging from building data warehouses, migration projects, to building student portals to implementing best in class security. So feel free to reach out um, if there is anything um, we can help you with. Thank you for your time and I'll pass it on to David now to wrap up. Uh, thanks very much, Sula. Um, look, it's great to get that background. Um, I look, we have a couple of questions to, to go through and um, and for good or bad, Roy, I, I, I think they're headed your way. So um, please be ready to unmute and, and to answer. First one is, look, I understand that your team at CQ, you recently had a workshop regarding the future of chatbots and AI. Are you able to share any of the potential visions of the future use of bots at CQU? Oh, thanks. That's a great question. Um, and it was a it was a fun workshop. I was in part of it, so I'll give you the bits that I can give you. The reason we held the workshop is uh, we had to, um, you know, while we're focusing in on bots in this learning and teaching space right now, we've already started that journey. Um, the application and the support about them for for students and in all the other aspects of their student life, we, you know, that was that was what we needed. Uh, to unpack as a university. Uh, so we already have a different type of bot in the services space, for example. One of the themes that came through was really thinking about different personas for bots and um, when when a persona might change, depending on uh, the type of question and the service that the bot might provide. 
So there was a lot of discussion around that. Um, one of the exercises of the uh, was also about trying to think, where do you want it to be two years from now? So there's some great technology that works now that we can use, uh, but it's all about how you implement and get get to that mature point where it's it's really providing that value. So so we let ourselves think out there. One of the attributes that we uh, we identify that would be really important is the natural language processing for that for the bots. So not just thinking about them as uh, something that you type in and ask questions. Um, it needs to be able to use um, real world language and increasingly it's got to use uh, cope with accents or even different languages. And all our institutions are probably very multicultural, certainly ours is. And so, and our markets are changing. So they're things that are attributes of future bots that we, um, that we unpacked. That's probably enough to get things going. I, I mean, without being obvious, stating the obvious, that obviously what uh, Sula just outlined in terms of Alex being that, um, that subject expert inside your classes um, is, is something that we're very keenly uh, pursuing. Okay, so, oh, thanks, Roy. And this this is um, this is one that gee, either, either it could be a combination of Sulab and you, Roy. And it's mm. is this is the solution or the ecosystem, whatever term it's going to be, is is all of that that you're talking about is is that just something that you plug in, um, <laughs> or is it or is development required to fine tune it to the university's specific needs? Um. I'll go f quickly first uh, and say um, anything that I've ever bought or been told that I could just plug in, um, mm -hmm. never, never did. Um, you have to make it work for you. Uh, that's that's ultimately that you have to do that. So there was a lot of work to make what I quickly showed you on the screen there work uh, for CQ, and uh, and I don't think we really found anyone else had done it quite that way. It's got to suit your organisation. Uh, and your business rules, how you want to operate it. You've got to do all that work uh, up front to, to work out how the APIs that are there will work between all the major LMSs and, um, and teams, for example. So, Lab, did you want to add anything more? Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree with you more, Roy. Um, the, there's definitely work um, uh, uh, required when it comes to um, you know, streamlining that student experience, especially when it comes to integration and on automating with your existing learning management systems. That mm. can only be done once we understand your goals, we understand how your data flows are and what we're ultimately looking to achieve. Yeah. In saying that, when we do do pilots, uh, the pilots are actually self-contained um, and we do actually implement them fairly out of the box. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the customers have an opportunity to touch and feel and then say, how, then see how they want to expand on that, and then you know automate and integrate with other systems, etc. Thanks, Philip. Sorry, the question's come in. It's made me laugh. Um, can chatbots really answer questions? Is it actually a real thing? Can, can I answer that one? <laughs> Please. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> um, I'm assuming it's a serious question. Yes, it really is true, and the technology is advancing so quickly that it is um, already being used in certain industries where um, the percentage of people who can tell that a chatbot's answering versus human answering is less than 30%. And that that it depends on the circumstances, depends on the context, depends what sort of questions are being asked and um, all of those sort of things. But knowledge bases and curating the content behind it and, and contextualizing it as, as um, Roy, um has has said is important but yeah absolutely it's a real thing right, and i'm no, happy I'm, I'm happy to take um um that person um software as well i'm more than happy to show you how chat sure, yeah work. that's a great yeah still have nice okay. one yeah now look another question's come through about the implementation of the program roy how did you do that from a communications and adopt adoption perspective and i hate to ask can you do that in 60 seconds or less <sighs> Uh, so you have to invest in, in people who can help you communicate. Uh, so you know, IT people aren't necessarily always good at that. Um, so you make your IT people understand they've got to communicate, build the lead time to get communication right, get feedback, 
and uh, and just keep working at it. So you need you need project officers who can really help you reach out and understand what what people are ready for and what they need help with. So communication is really a key part. Investing in that communication channel is part of the overarching change management. Yeah. Thanks, Roy. Now, everyone, look, it's time for a quick recap. I've got a big clock in front of me that says uh, I need to start winding up. So look, we started with a problem we've all experienced, that is how to stay connected, to get the information we need uh, in a timely manner and in a time that suits us and have a more personalised experience. And then we also looked at it from the perspective of the educators. Now, how can they better respond to a deluge of questions? And through the background of Thomas and the real world experience of Roy, we saw that the way students engage at CTU today is different from yesterday. So those, those answers, those questions are being answered. So the students and the staff are communicating via a common platform that allows AI to provide actually meaningful insights into the experience of the students, but also then serves as the basis, as Roy mentioned earlier, for an agile development so you can test new capability, capabilities. And if they don't work, you just move on. You haven't actually had to invest in a whole nother platform. Now, I do hope that some of the true value of the approaches undertaken by CQU have been understood, but also that you have the confidence that change is actually possible and, and that it's possible now. Now, we're almost at time, so I'd like to thank um, you all for attending, plus Roy, Thomas, uh, Sulab, and not forgetting Christine um, from the Cloud Collective, who's been running the session in the background. So thanks, Christine. So I hope that you've all learned something new or indeed can see a place where these technologies and approaches and capabilities can help improve the student and staff experience and ultimately help these people connect and stay engaged along the way. And lastly, should you have any follow-up questions where only a phone call, a link or email away, and who knows, look, it, it may be a bot that answers your initial question, but the reality you probably know. And with that, thank you again and I wish you all a wonderful day. So thank you everyone.